Um, yeah, so this uh, this web meeting will be uh, registered, as you know. <laughs> uh, so um, welcome to, to this session um, of uh, the H2 Hub Bologna uh, uh, webinar. So we are very uh, happy to have uh, three uh, very interesting speakers today. So um, I will quickly start with an introduction of uh, H2 Hub Wallonia. What is it? Um, in fact, uh, the objective of uh, H2 Hub Wallonia it's within the cluster tweed is to create an hydrogen ecosystem for Wallonia. And the first step was that in Belgium, we have a, a lot of opportunities for hydrogen technologies uh, within the energy and climate plans. And um, so there is a real Belgian uh, level vision for the hash 2 but as well CO2 network. Uh, as you may uh, know that Fluxis uh, is working quite hard to develop, to, to develop this, uh, this grid. And uh, you can see that Charleroi and Liège will be two main cluster for hydrogen and CO2. So um, in the recovery plan, uh, mm -hmm. there is a lot of opportunities linked to uh, the hydrogen sector. Three years ago, uh, we have been uh, mandated by the um, uh, Walloon government to uh, make a work a roadmap for hydrogen for Wallonia. So to have a picture of what is going on uh, in hydrogen, what is the potential for Wallonia in this field. And uh, the objective was to develop some scenarios of uh, hydrogen production. Um, and so we have uh, uh, presented this uh, roadmap that has been validated by the industries uh, to the government. And we are quite happy because um, in this roadmap, we have presented and proposed to the Wallonia government some projects uh, that could be related to mobility, uh, H2 ejection, H2 for industry, and so on. And we have proposed to invest in, uh, in let's say, subsidies to um, let uh, this hydrogen sector in, in Wallonia. And when we see the, the last uh, decision that has been uh, decided uh, for Wallonia, we see that hydrogen is a very important part for the recovery plan. And uh, one of the basis was that uh, we, were, we were presenting some industrial project at that time, and now we we try and we have succeed to finance some of them. So we are quite happy to have this roadmap for sure. Uh, one of the objective of the Hash2 Hub Wallonia will be to actualize, to update this roadmap uh, because there are a lot of new players in the value chain. So as you've seen uh, two years ago, we have identified uh, some players, but for sure we can add a lot of names. Um, we are already 16 here in the meeting and we will be uh, more during this meeting and we see that there is a, a, um, a big potential for players in the, in the value chain. So we will update this value chain analysis uh, within the, uh, this uh, H2 Hub Wallonia uh, department, let's say, of the Cluster Tweed. And um, we will deep uh, make a selection for technologies that could be used in the technical value chain. For sure, when we build an elect electrolyzers, we, you, you need extra devices like purification unit, compression system, storage, st transport system, and so on. And so uh, in that value chain, that is a, an European value chain, um, we have place to put our technologies. And I think it's one of the objectives of this club. Um, for the last three years, uh, we see that uh, we have uh, the research centers, universities, uh, and some startups uh, have developed some interesting technologies in Wallonia. Uh, so it's more than 8 million euros just for innovation related to hydrogen. And today we will uh, uh, make a, a focus on Loop FC project. Um, with the same arrow, uh, but for sure we, we can uh, in uh, next working groups related to this topic for the cluster tweet, we will uh, present some of these projects in the next uh, meetings. So as you may see, have seen uh, in the last months, uh, Wallonia well have decided to invest uh, 100 million euros within the recovery plan for some projects. 
here it's a list of projects, not just the, the project for, for the recovery plan, but interesting industrial project that uh, we can uh, propose to you uh, to, uh, to, to present. So uh, it's more related to the two clusters from Liège and Charleroi and even for uh, Tournai and Mons. And we see interesting projects that could be related to e uh CCU project, uh, electrolyzers for clean mobility within the airport, uh, electrolysis uh, related to waste plants, uh, a big reflection for pyrolysis of methane on CCGT power station. Uh, we have some project of public hydrogen uh, power station, uh, interesting project for biogas from an agri-food industry, uh, French fries industry, and you, we, we, we can use waste for uh, improvement uh, of ash to production and uh, injection of uh, hydrogen. Uh, we have interesting project of hybrid uh, hydrogen storage solution. Uh, Cinero is a partner and, and they will be uh, presenting this project. Uh, and we have some public hydrogen filling station that is planned. The first one is in Erve uh, with the Colorado uh, group. That's uh, and so uh, we see that it's moving quite fast. Uh, this hydrogen sector uh, in Wallonia, the recovery plan will invest in big projects. One of these projects is the Columbus project, which is a collaboration between John Cochrill, Carmeuse, and uh, NG Store Energy uh, that will produce uh, a big electrolyzer stack of uh, 75 megawatts uh, to produce grain hydrogen and. Uh, to uh, produce in the end uh, e-methane uh, with the uh, CCU uh, technology, so the CO2 uh, um, recuperation from uh, the um, Carmeuse uh, uh, site. So it's a very interesting uh, project that will be uh, presented uh, and validated in September for the recovery plan. Another one that has been validated two weeks ago, and we are quite happy to have it in Wallonia. It's a John Cochrill project uh, of an electrolyzers in uh, the Liège airport, and they will uh, produce green electricity for the uh, fleet uh, inside the airport, but uh, as well uh, an opportunity for the logistics part around uh, the Liège airport uh, site. Um, next step for the, um, uh, our, let's say, uh, club, uh, we are working quite hard for a new project uh, related to hydrogen. Uh, we know that there will be uh, 15 million euros um, inside the recovery plan from Wallonia to support industry to achieve CO2 neutrality. And we are building with a lot of big players because you can see AGC, AG, uh, AGC Aperam, Carmeuse, John Cochrill, Preyon, Kno, Fiara, CRM, uh, Materia Nova. So there is a, 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 some, some players that want to, uh, uh, let's say, to study the three main roads for the uh, CO2 neutrality for industry is the electrification, is the hydrogen, and it's, uh, it's the CCUS technologies. And the main topics will be uh, the process electrification, the uh, hydrogen production uh, by electrolysis or by plasma pyrolysis. Uh, hydrogen utilization for processes and uh, capture and concentration of CO2. Uh, so um, we are working with uh, Paul Mekatech and Greenwin to uh, make it happen. Um, another uh, hot topic will be to use a hydrogen for heavy trucks. And so um, we want to be related to H2 corridor. Uh, there is a project that is uh, trying to manage a corridor of hydrogen uh, within Europe. And uh, Wallonia, for sure, it's a good place to put a hydrogen station for trucks and for logistics. And so we will work with logistics in Wallonia uh, to, um, uh, let's say, study the potential uh, to place new hydrogen station for trucks. And uh, we are organizing um, in September a big year, but a, 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 a networking event with logistics in Wallonia and Mekatech for the new uh, mobility, uh, electric mobility, but as well um, 
uh, mobility from gases, uh, green gases and uh, hydrogen for trucks, for cars and so on, will the presence of our Minister of Energy. So, um, and uh, in very great place in the pavillon uh, uh, de la Citadelle de Namur. So uh, it's, a, it's a very great building uh, uh, in Namur and we will use the um, the new, um, I don't know the name in English, but uh, teleferic <laughs> to to go to go there. So uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to 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 be there. And uh, last but not least, one of a topic in uh, in Wallonia is to um, produce uh, with the CO2 and with hydrogen. We can uh, produce uh, synthetic fuels. And there is one of the, these projects is the Neutral Kiro project. That is a collaboration between University of Liège, uh, Reza, uh, Amon, and Dustmet Engineering. And they want to study the potential of producing um, e-kerosene uh, from uh, hydrogen and CO2, so synthetic uh, kerosene, uh, to produce and maybe to use it for the airport, uh, airport of uh, Liège Airport of aeronautics in general. So it's a, a topic, and so I'm quite happy that today we are, let's say, launching a collaboration with uh, another competitive cluster in Wallonia, Skywin. Uh, so the objective uh, between this um, joint collaboration for hydrogen between Tweed and Skywin is to uh, make working groups together, uh, working of innovative projects and to have our energy, let's say, expertise for, for Tweed and aeronautics and technologies for Skywin um, in different topics like e-fuels or uh, for sure hydrogen production aircraft. And so uh, this uh, introduction will be uh, ended by uh, uh, Sky, Skywin. So I will let the place uh, to Pierre Jean from Skywin uh, just to uh, explain uh, what could be done with Skywin uh, within the hydrogen sector. So, so thank you, Cedric, um, and hello, everybody. I will try to share my, my screen. Uh, I think it's okay. Yeah, perfect. And I will also try to be to be short today. Uh, but I'm very, very happy to, to give you a first uh, overview about Skywin uh, activities. And uh, Cedric said that uh, Cluster Treaties already co collaborates with other uh, competitive clusters such as uh, Megatech, uh, Logistic in Wallonia, uh, and Green Wings. So uh, at Skywin, we think that uh, the, the starting collaboration with Street will be a, a really a strategic partnership for the next future, particularly in link with the evolution of the aeronautic sector and the need to reduce the, the environmental impact and the carbon emission of the airplanes. Uh, the, the, the hydrogen roadmap and, uh, and, uh, and the value chain presented by Cedric is really a, a useful document for us, a, use, a useful reference for us. So what is Skywin in a few words? Uh, Skywin is a competitive cluster. So in the, in the meaning of all the competitivity in, Fra in French, so based on the triple helix model and the triple helix concept. So the, the first goal of, of Skywin is to develop uh, to, and to engage a public-private partnership with uh, companies, training centers, and specifically research units to develop uh, R&D collaborative and innovative projects in the aeronautic and space sectors, uh, particularly in the, the partnership with, uh, with Street, we will focus on the, the aeronautic sector. So today, uh, today Skywin is, uh, has more than 150 members. Most of them are, are companies, and most of these companies are SMEs. But we also cover all the, the academics and research capabilities available in Wallonia in, the, in, the, in, the, in our activities. To introduce shortly the need of collaboration between the aeronautic and the energy ecosystems, you can see here the, the, the vision at a European scale for a cleaner aviation. It will be the, the major program, uh, research program uh, for, for aviation, which will be developed in the, in the, in the next few months uh, to, to replace the existing Clean Sky 2 for the ones who, who knew the, that program. The new one will be named Clean Aviation. And, uh, 
So, so you can see that in terms of reduction of CO2 emissions, 40% uh, 40 40 of the objective will be in relation with the development of new sources of, of energies and with new fuels. So, of course, in, in, in relationship with uh, the, the use of uh, H2 and with the use of uh, synthetic uh, fuels. So we need to develop new partnerships uh, with new partners, with new companies, and with experts active in this kind of activities that we haven't yet in in the in the the, the, the sky uh, environment. So the partnership with Street is is really a good way to develop this kind of collaboration uh, for the future for us. So at this time, we think that we. The attention must be focused on, on three specific topics, uh, synthetic fuels and, alter, and alternatives to kerosene, uh, energy storage on, on the large way of, uh, of mine, and, and the use of uh, H2 in aerospace and particularly in aeronautics. This is a quite large scope and a lot of different applications could be more precisely addressed in the, in the future, of course. As all the, the with all the competitive clusters in Wallonia, we have a tool, a specific tool, to, a specific tool, sorry, to develop this kind of project uh, at, at the pool of competitivity level. Sorry, uh, and th this project are always a collaboration between industry and research bodies, but always with an industrial lead, leading with an industrial leader in in, in every case. The funding level is the highest level available in, in Wallonia and in Europe. So this is funding and not, and not financial advance. Uh, and uh, this funding level is the, the, the highest one as well for companies, uh, research centers and universities. So it's very attractive level, I think. Uh, to get this level, of course, uh, the, the the consortia must pass through a double jury process, the first one at the cluster level and the second one at, a, at, a, at the, the one government level, sorry, and this second level is common to all the, the pool of competitivity, to the, all the pool of competitivity, the competitivity cluster in, in Wallonia. Uh, of course, uh, uh, through, throughout the, the, the whole process, uh, project partners will benefit of Skywin and Tweet support and assistance uh, to, to, to build and develop and try to, 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 to reach the, the, the fund, of course, and to, to reach the labelization of the, of the process. You can see shortly that the process is quite long for the ones who, who didn't, didn't knew the, the process yet. Uh, around six months to build. Uh, to evaluate and to collaborate the project, and uh, and in case of success, at least three more months before starting the the, the, the R and D activities. But I think that the the the, the objective of the of these uh, excellence uh, projects uh, need to have a, a, such a, a, a long uh, evaluation process. So just to give you. Uh, uh, an overview of, uh, of the next call uh, agenda. Then this next call is just starting. So we are waiting for a letter of intent uh, for the 16th of, uh, of July. And then the, the process will, will continue with a pre-project in September, complete project in November and, uh, and final evaluation in, in, in December. And so the, the, the decision of the Wallon jury is uh, should should be uh, now in, in next March. So uh, at least one call. We, we have a call every six months. So uh, this is not the, the only opportunity to, to collaborate. So today, I just want to, to open the door and, and to, to let's say, to let you know that uh, this collaboration with Street is, is starting and we are really open to, to to propose it, proposals to, to idea of projects. So don't hesitate to, to contact me or Cedric directly if you need more information on the process or, or, or something else. So uh, again, uh, I will be short, so I will stop there, but uh, I'm very, very happy to, to start this collaboration. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Pierre Jean. So, um, uh, there is for sure some opportunities in Wallonia to, 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 to support innovative projects. And for sure, there are a lot of opportunities at the European level. And so, we are quite happy here to uh, give the floor to uh, Bart Biebeuk, um, so, uh, which is the executive director of uh, FZHU uh, for more than five years. Uh, and uh, with an experience is, uh, in Toyota Motor Europe before and a long experience and uh, also a deputy mayor uh, for, uh, in one uh, cities uh, in, in Flanders. So um, I'm very um, happy to have Bart on board today uh, because uh, a lot of um, members uh, of Tweed can play a role, I'm sure, within the next calls of SEHU and see where are the opportunities. So uh, give you the floor, Bart, uh, to uh, explain us the European R&D, uh, let's say, program about hydrogen technologies. Thank you very much, uh, Cedric. And it's great to be here. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Cluster Tweet and, uh, and Wallonia what you're doing on hydrogen. To be very honest, it was great to see uh, this uh, presentation from you. And I'm quite impressed about the progress that Wallonia have made in the, in the past years. Uh, so really well done. Uh, <laughs> Thank so I will share my presentation. I prepare something for you and I um, really hope that after my presentation we can have some discussions because there are so many things that are ongoing and i could talk for hours with uh, with you on what we are all doing so it would be very good to know what you are interested in and what kind of questions that you have so that we can help you okay so um first of all for those who would not know the fchju yet um so we are a public-private partnership uh, between the industry and the research, so Hydrogen Europe industry, which has now already more than 270 members. They were growing immensely. And then uh, we have Hydrogen Europe research, 83 uh, members. The money we get from the European Commission, which is the public side, and with that money we can fund projects, and we have funded so far 285 projects for more than 1 billion euro. And the private side has also put uh, more than 1 billion euro in kind uh, in, into this uh, pot or into these projects. We are working on three different kinds of uh, pillars on energy, uh, which on production, distribution, but also transport, road, non road, and cross cutting is more horizontal matter uh, on standardization and safety. Uh, we started basically in 2019 with, to create a hydrogen vision by 2050. And this was uh, done together with a lot of companies, as you can see. And the outcome was quite, uh, I'd say, uh, immense, or was quite surprisingly that Haji could play such a big role. Actually, 24% of the final energy demand in 2050 could be supplied through hydrogen. We could abate annually 560 million tons, create an annual revenue of 820 billion euro, and create in Europe 5.4 million jobs. So when we look a little bit closer uh, to 2030, uh, what we have done is we have analyzed all the national energy and climate plans. Also, Belgium has made one uh, for the 27 member states. And we have looked about what is the potential for hydrogen. And we have basically looked in two kinds of scenarios, a high level scenario and a low level scenario. And when we look in, in, into the entire 27 member states plus the UK, well, up to 56 gigawatt of electrolyzers uh, will be necessary. And we would be then reduce uh, 67 million tons CO2, create around 30 billion euro added value and 360,000 jobs in Europe by 2030. And when we zoom in, in into Belgium, uh, so Belgium could use about 2.3 gigawatt electrolyzers and create 1.14 billion euro added value and 11,000 jobs which is more or less in line also with the re recent uh, news that I heard about, I think it was yesterday here in Belgium, they said, okay, and the green energy, we can create 30,000 jobs uh, in Belgium. Um, so this is perfectly in line. So you could see that probably hydrogen could bring uh, one third of those jobs. Uh, then what happened next to that was then on 8th of July, the European hydrogen strategy, I'm sure some of you know them, but just uh, three phases. The first phase, six gigawatt by 2024 of electrolyzers, mainly to replace the existing hydrogen. Then by 2030, we will put 40 gigawatt of electrolyzers uh, 
to look into new applications like steel, but also heavy duty, uh, to use it also for grid balancing purposes. And of course, we will create more hydrogen values as well by 2030. And after phase three, we believe the technology is matured and uh, it will be deployed at large scale. All these phases will be supported by a new instrument, which is called the Clean Hydrogen Alliance, uh, to really make the EU investment agenda. It's clear that uh, the European Union will not put only public money in this. This has to be done together with the private side, and uh, that's why they have launched this alliance. Uh, this alliance, uh, they have now today already more than 1,000 uh, companies uh, in that alliance, so that's quite a, a lot. It's, I think it's huge. It's much bigger than, than, for example, the battery alliance. It shows also basically the, the strong intents from the industry to really working on hydrogen and then make it happen. So it was launched also at the 8th of July. To, the mission is very simple, to create a pipeline for massive rollout of the clean hydrogen technology. They will involve all the stakeholders and the, we estimate that by 2030, we might need to invest about 430 billion euro to realize the, um, the objectives that we have in, in Europe. They also, as I mean, they organize themselves a little bit by uh, round tables. They have six round tables, but for the sake of time, I will not go into detail. They are all led by, by CEOs, by the way. We started back in 2016 a bit on also building awareness in Europe around hydrogen. I have to admit that at that time, uh, <clears throat> uh, there were not so many people knew about hydrogen. It's quite different today, unfortunately. And so we started with the cities and regions initiative with almost 100 regions across Europe. That led into three actions. The first action was that uh, some of these regions, they said, look, we really want to go much faster. For us, it has a huge potential to create jobs and economical growth. So we want to assemble ourselves in the European Hydrogen Values Partnership. There are now a little bit more than 40 regions uh, in that partnership. And that's mainly led by North Netherlands, Auvergne uh, Ronald, Normandy and Aragon in Spain. But also, on the other hand, we had a number of regions that are not really so far yet. Uh, they, they had a lot of good ideas, but they need to be matured more. And so that's why we provided uh, consultancy uh, services. So we paid a consultant to help those regions uh, with their plans to bring them more uh, to a maturity level so that they can apply for funding, uh, for example, in Malonia, for example. Um, it was a great success, uh, this project development assistance program. And so by the end of uh, 2021, we will have another uh, big uh, PDA launch. But the third uh, action, which quite what came out of it, was the Hygiene Valley concept. And actually was also very happy that our president, Ursula von der Leyen, she said that uh, she would like to create more hydrogen valleys in Europe. And she wants to use, for example, the next generation EU or this big uh, recovery fund. We have already a couple of examples of hydrogen valleys in Europe. I mean, we started first in the Orkney Islands in the north part of the UK, where we basically produce hydrogen on the islands, and then it brings, then we bring it to the mainland to, to uh, have uh, vehicles um, driven on hydrogen, but also to charge the ferries, etc. But also it's used for heating in a school and so on. But that was a small project, even though at that time it was quite big, but then we said, look, let's build a huge uh, hydrogen valley. And we made a call for that. And finally, North Netherlands won that call. Um, it's the Project Heaven, we call it. Uh, it's 31 partners in it. And in particular, what is important is the sectorial integration. Uh, so the sectors like uh, transport, uh, industry, heating and cooling, they are all integrated to, and working together um, to, to create such a hydrogen um, economy or, a, or an ecosystem. And that is what the Hydrogen Valley is all about, is creating such a sectorial integration, such an ecosystem. And finally, this year in January, we started with another uh, Hydrogen Valley, which is the Green Highland project, is that uh, Spain, uh, with uh, the island Palma, uh, Palma um, the island of Mallorca, basically. I have decided to become the first hygiene island in Europe. And also here again, we see this sectoral integration. For the future, we believe we will do more hygiene valleys uh, and we will focus also on cross-border hygiene valleys. And then you can think about ports, airports, and uh, many other uh, hubs, but also why not building the first hydrogen city in, in Europe. Um, another important 
steps that we another important uh, happening was actually the elect the increase of the capacity and lowering of the cost of the electrolyzers that's also why hydrogen is now really seen as a as a huge potential to contribute for the decarbonization because 10 years ago when we started we built the first uh, electrolyzer in, in Halle uh, and, and that was 150 kilowatt at that time and then gradually you can see we pushed the envelope we, we tried to double almost every time we made a call and finally we are now at 100 megawatts so you can say that almost in 10 years time we went from 100 kilowatt to 100 megawatt of course in the next years we will have to put more uh, 100 megawatts uh, electrolyzers and finally go to even gigawatt scale and the 100 megawatts it's very big but it looks really that there's a lot of uh, interest i mean the european commission has launched the green deal call last year uh, to install such a 100 megawatt electrolyzer uh, the call is closed now there are 16 proposals received there are two winners which will be announced pretty soon and um it, it, but it, for me, what was most important, if you receive 16 proposals for 100 megawatt, it really shows that there are business cases and that it, it works. So that was for me the, the main message. Also, uh, another thing we have developed in, on the European level was the guarantees of origin scheme for hydrogen. We worked together with Initio. Uh, the first phase was mainly about definition on, on, on green, blue, low carbon, etc. But then also we tried it in, in, in four different um, production plants in France, in Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands, uh, different ways. We have issued and so far now more than 70,000 uh, GEOs, guarantees of origins. And now we started with Certified Tree, which is basically set up a platform for really piloting these guarantees of origin across Europe. Um, and for that, we're working together with the AIB, the Association of the Issuing Bodies, but also, for example, Service Public de Wallonie as part of this uh, consortium to roll out. And at the same time, we know that we need to agree on a definition or a methodology to calculate the CO2 footprint of each different hydrogen production process. Uh, we need to agree on that on a global level in order to uh, unlock um, future cross-border uh, trading. And for that, we're working together in the IPHE. Right? So they have a task force there. And, and, and I have to say it goes uh, pretty well and everybody is aligned to, to make a worldwide agreement. Um, also, we work on a lot of uh, projects related to the different modes of transport. You can see here all the modes basically from uh, every mode can be propelled by hydrogen. First uh, big project was H2ME. It's a project where basically we put more than 1,400 vehicles on the road. We built uh, a lot of uh, hydrogen refueling stations across uh, Europe and, and really to, to, to try to learn uh, also how we can make a business case for that, how we can build a, a strategy for that. And so it's quite, it's still ongoing, but it's quite successful. Uh, a lot of those vehicles are kind of these uh, range extender vehicles uh, as well. And we have also Toyota Hyundai vehicles and that's so, uh, a lot of um, uh, interest in this project. Um, what another project we did is actually we link all the hydrogen refueling stations in a central database that we are managing. And so the idea here is that uh, we can see immediately every minute actually it's refreshed the, this kind of um, say online uh, database is a, we can see whether the station is open, whether it's in maintenance, etc. And uh, actually already here I can tell you it's green. Uh, I have to update this, uh, this graph a little bit, but uh, it is very important to give some certainty to uh, drivers with, uh, of, uh, of uh, fuel cell cars or fuel cell trucks in the future that to know that the station will be open. So as you can see, we have now a little bit more than, I, mean, I think now today we have 145 stations in Europe. <clears throat> we did a lot of um, funding on, on bus projects. I mean, we started quite a long time ago, back in 2010, where we had a number of um, projects following uh, up each other, uh, where we have funded tens of buses. Finally, now with Jive and Jive 2, we were funding now uh, hundreds of buses. Um, when we look to Jive, Jive 2, I mean, almost all the orders are placed now uh, with five suppliers, uh, Van Hol, Solaris, Rydbus, Safra, and Caetano, which is very important. It really shows that there is competition. This helps to drive down the price. Uh, we will 
Uh, we have seen now the first buses delivered in several uh, cities. Uh, we, we hope by the end of this year, or maybe beginning of next year, that all the buses will be uh, on the road. Um, at the same time, we also saw a lot of, of a lot of other OEMs now also embarking on, on hydrogen buses. And, and, and I believe this is one of the big successes that among the bus OEMs, we have really made a good noise and, and finally uh, they, they are all uh, starting to develop. At the same time, uh, we should be very proud here in Belgium that Van Hol received uh, the best bus of the world in 2019 at Bus World. It really shows that this technology is ready uh, to be deployed. Just um, what we achieved through all our projects is that we reduced the cost continuously, uh, where we started at 1.8 million euro in 2009. Now we are at around 500,000, and we know that when the orders are above 100, uh, per, I mean, per one order, then we can reach 350,000. And we see these orders coming. Yeah? I mean, the city of Essen recently has ordered 100 hydrogen buses in a go, and, that, and this is outside our program. So it really starts. Um, what we also do know is that coaches are the next challenge. I mean, we have worked a lot on city buses, and in a way for us, this is done. Uh, coaches is, a, let's say, another challenge because you need to have the the space to save your, your, your luggage and so on, and it's a longer distance. That's why we started now. Our first project on that is Coach High Feet, and uh, we will put uh, six uh, coaches uh, on the road and, and dress, test them. Also heavy duty trucks now, we have two uh, demonstration projects. One is H2 Hall, uh, where Coleridge is there, part of it. Um, there we will do two uh, configurations, the tractored one and also the rigid configuration. And we will see this year and next year the deployment of the trucks. At the same time, we also do uh, refuse trucks, uh, 15 of them. Uh, this is, of course, a bit of a different uh, usage. It's back to back, back to base missions every day. Uh, we really focus here on standardization of the design. And we already have the first trucks deployed in Bedra. Um, overall, we will have 30 trucks and 13 demonstration sites in seven countries. And end of last year, very important, the industry had committed to put 100,000 trucks and 1,500 HRS by 2030 in the EU. And I was glad to see also the chart of Valonia with uh, these uh, stations, hydrogen refueling stations for trucks that you have foreseen. Uh, we also work a bit on rail. Uh, one of the projects is FCH2 Rail. This followed after a, um, a study that we did together with uh, Shift to Rail. That's another joint undertaking. Um, this is a, a project in Spain uh, with uh, CAF. And basically, this is a kind of a hybrid version. So the train can work on the catenary, but at the same time, when the catenary is not there anymore, then he will shift to a uh, uh, using fuel cells. And so the project uh, just started also in January. And the idea is now first they will uh, identify the, the right use case, uh, the right uh, location and based also on different profiles. And then they will design the right uh, fuel cell, um, let's say performance or stack performance that they need or the size that they want to have. And this is also together, I mean, also Portugal is there, so there will also be some testing in Portugal of that train as well. Um, also, on the maritime side, we have been very active and a bit a similar story. We have pushed, you can see, uh, to uh, the capacity of the fuel cell uh, each time with the new project higher and higher. Uh, so especially from uh, 2018, it really became uh, clear that also hydrogen will be required to decarbonize uh, the, the, the maritime sector. Uh, we, at that time, we did a call for one megawatt, then the year after two megawatt, now we are a three megawatt um, vessel. And the last one will also be liquid hydrogen stored on, on the ship. Uh, I think it's really one of the, the flagships. And of course, they will try in the project, they also try to make a conceptual design for a 20 megawatt ship, which we hope that in the course of the next joint undertaking, uh, we might try to realize this one. Uh, also, we're working with the ports. Uh, this is a project uh, H2 port, the port of uh, Valencia. They are trying to put uh, these uh, special uh, equipment like reach stackers or yard tractors on hydrogen. We have a mobile hydrogen refueling station there as well. And what happened now this week, uh, because we launched on the 1st of June, 
uh, together uh, with DGNR and the IEA, uh, the uh, Global Ports Hydrogen Coalition. And um, we are now with uh, 12 European ports in that coalition. Uh, one of them is the port of Antwerp, uh, of Antwerp, but also the port of Rotterdam is here. And so together we will try uh, to make a kind of roadmap worldwide to decarbonize ports using hydrogen. But this was a very important event that we got. Um, and by the way, we will also now start uh, with uh, making a European ports network. Uh, we have a tender uh, released uh, uh, May, beginning of May, and uh, we hope to start uh, with uh, this European ports network um, by, by September. And the idea is here to build a hydrogen roadmap for the European ports. So we had once the LNG roadmap, and now we want to make it for hydrogen. Um, together with Clean Sky, it was already mentioned, we also looked into um, powering aviation using hydrogen. Uh, we did this study was quite an impressive result. It shows that hydrogen is feasible. I mean, we can do it for less than 20 US dollars per passenger. We can reduce, of course, CO2 to zero, but also have a climate impact of, uh, of more than 70% reduction. And the whole idea is now to build a first prototype by 2028. Um, I can tell you that we are in very deep discussion with Clean Sky. We have created a Gantt chart, really, um, by when do we need which kind of parts and which time uh, with clear milestones. And, and, and so by normally by 2024, we will decide which will be the airplane and also the location, because we will still have to look for a location where the hydrogen plane will take off. Um, it, it's an ex extremely exciting uh, project and extremely challenging as well but we are all uh, determined to, to make it happen. Uh, also, we do a lot of educational activities. Uh, we have a lot of material available. So really, I'm happy to share all this material uh, with you, or if you would like to learn something, or you would like to know, uh, please do not, uh, to know if a certain course exists, or so contact us, no problem. And also, um, later on, I will show you also where we have saved all that education material on the websites. In addition, we also created the European Hydrogen Safety Panel. I mean, as you know very well, everybody wants to start now on, on hydrogen, and which is very, very good, and I'm extremely happy about that. At the same time, it risks now that we might have some, let's say, uh, less attention to safety, especially newcomers who are not familiar with hydrogen. Uh, they might not be uh, so well uh, educated on, on the safety uh, use of hydrogen. That's why we created these experts. What they are doing at the moment is basically they, we have a big database with more than 2000 incidents on hydrogen. They analyzed all those incidents. They made some kind of recommendations in, in a report, but also at the same time, um, they're helping us uh, to identify projects that are maybe yeah, a bit on the risky side. And so they are going then to the consortium and try to, to talk to them and to make sure that uh, they are performing their project in a safe way. Because uh, I can tell you, if we will have a big accident and people die, then uh, this would be a big setback for, for the hygiene community. And that is what I was talking about here in this slide is we created at the end of last year an observatory. Um, there you can see uh, basically everything related to technology and markets. For example, if you want to know how many cars, how many buses, how many trucks, or how many, uh, I mean, installed capacity already for electrolyzers we have in Europe, you can find that all in this, uh, in this observatory. Also, we have a lot of policies and regulations in there, codes and standards, patents. Patents is actually not yet, it will come very soon. Uh, funding opportunities there and there, you can find all our education materials. So every, what I mentioned before, we have all these programs funded and they have stored all their materials there as well. So feel free to have a look there. And then we come to a very interesting point is funding instruments um, in Europe. So as some of you might know, we will not uh, exist anymore as the FCHJU, uh, probably from the end of the year. We received a new name, which is called the Clean Hydrogen Joint Undertaking. We will focus on three pillars, hydrogen production, 
uh, hygiene distribution and end use. The distribution is somehow a bit new for us. So we will talk about uh, pipeline transport, new liquid carriers like ammonia, for example, um, but also large scale storage, et cetera. On the hydrogen refueling stations, that we will go really to, uh, to look for the heavy duty ones. And then in the end use, there clearly we, we, we stop looking at, at vehicles or at uh, forklifts and so on and, and city buses, but really go to heavy duty. So the trucks, maritime, aviation, coaches, and so on. Although we will keep working on the building blocks, it means the fuel cells itself, or also the, the, the tanks, uh, the, the, the reservoirs, and so on. We will keep working on that. On heat and power, something new will be the turbines and hydrogen burners for us. And of course, uh, we will continue to look uh, for hydrogen usage in industry and fund projects there. As mentioned, hydrogen valleys will, will continue. Also, the cross cutting activity will continue. Something new is also to, is the supply chain. We really need to start to think how we can support tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers, also because they will need to upgrade their manufacturing into new products, and, and I'm sure we will need to support them. Uh, at the same time, hydrogen is not unique, uniquely anymore to the joint, our joint undertaking. It will be divided in seven different partnerships, of course. Our joint undertaking is the biggest one, and I call it a bit of the mother JU. But the process for planet, which is about the chemical side, will have hydrogen topics to zero, which is about transport, has hydrogen topics, but then also waterboard, steel, aviation rail, they all will have water, um, they all will have hydrogen topics. We expect to start our new joint undertaking by the end of this year. Let's hope that the parliament is working quite fast and also the council so that we have our legislation approved. And the budget foreseen at the moment is 1 billion euro, which is a 50% increase compared to our current JU. Other parts of, uh, of uh, uh, European Commission where you can have uh, funding opportunities in the Connecting Euro facility, mainly for hydrogen refueling stations, the Innovation Fund uh, for scaling up. There, are, there was a call already done with quite a lot of hydrogen projects as well there. The IPSE is not money, but it's a regulatory framework uh, where basically then uh, you can uh, waive the um, state rules. And that means that, for example, uh, Wallon government could invest more in a certain company. And then we have the next generation EU, um, where also hydrogen was uh, promoted to have projects there. And I can tell you that the results are really amazing. We see now so many hydrogen projects in the next generation EU. That was a big success. Final, some uh, publicity. Uh, we will have our second European Hygiene Week uh, from 29th November to the 3rd of December. And the big thing will be the launch of the Clean Hydrogen Joint Undertaking with new logo, etc., etc. So be there because there's a lot of people there. I mean, last year we had more than 10,000 people from 63 countries. So uh, because you will see that we have, we have normally like five commissioners there, a lot of ministers from all over Europe. So if you really want to catch what's going on in Europe on hydrogen, that's the place to be. Okay, and now I'm ready for questions. So thank you, Bart. It was very, very interesting. And for sure, it's in Brussels, huh? the, the next big meeting. So we, we have no excuses to be there. Um, so uh, I've received one question uh, by email uh, um, from uh, Ash2Win, that is a startup that is, is developing an enzymatic um, catalyzers, new technology for green hydrogen production. And so they have a TR, TRL4 uh, lab demo, uh, so thanks to private investment and well-known support. And they have attempts, let's say, uh, to get subsidy from uh, different European calls with big players like Toyota, Beckert, and so on. And the question is, um, uh, is there a coal that fits for disruptive uh, renewable uh, enzymatic catalyzers, but uh, in general, let's say a TR4 uh, technology uh, in the next year? Uh, I don't know. Well, I mean, we are still building now our topics for the next year because uh, normally we are planning to have, to have our first call in December this year. Again, subject to the approval of our council regulation. Uh, otherwise, it will be January, February next year, but then one around summertime next year and then the year after. So you can say that in the next one year, we will spend more around 450 million euro of this 1 billion euro. So it's really kind of front loading of the program that we will do uh, because we have this big ambition in Europe on hygiene. So we really need to front load it a bit. 
Um, yes, there will be, uh, we are funding project from low TRL, TRL2 up to TRL8. Uh, so, and there will be for sure uh, projects on uh, TRL4, 5 level uh, for uh, electrolyzers or catalysts. Um, of course, I don't know exactly what, what he's talking about, uh, what he would like to see, but um, for sure. Uh, there will be opportunities, but I mean, we should discuss in detail, of course, but uh, we will have uh, topics uh, at least in that area. And if you really want, I mean, if the persons really want to, to help to shape the program and the topics, uh, the best way is to become a member of Hygiene Europe of the association, because that's how we work. Basically, we ask them to write the topics for us, and then we are analyzing and scrutinize them in a way. That's our role. But... Uh, that's how we can have an impact. Either. Yeah, um, I, I just suggest to to uh, to the members and participants that you can use the chat session to uh, to to ask your question. Um, in terms of uh, members uh, from uh, from Belgium and maybe from Wallonia that is already part of ESIAGU, uh, you can maybe put some names. Uh, I suppose John Cochrel is part. Or... Yeah, there are. Uh, I mean, for, there are many um, partners. I think that we in Europe and Belgium now we have around, I think, fifty beneficiaries, more or less, fifty, sixty yeah, okay. uh, companies that receive money from the FCHU. Um, I mean, Colorate, for example, is for sure is one. But then uh, we have Waterstuff Net. Uh, we have uh, there are several. I mean, there are several yeah. ones. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, with um, with Waterstuffnet, Tweed is uh, creating right now a, a Belgian map with Fluxis. Uh, we are putting all the names of projects that we have uh, for Waterstuffnet in Flanders for sure, and uh, Wallonia for uh, um, and us for Wallonia. And with the help of uh, Fluxis, we we are trying to make to 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 have a, a Belgian, let's say, view of what is going on. Uh, 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 um, about the projects, players, uh, and uh, investment that is planned. So uh, for sure, we will uh, we will continue this work. A specific technical question: um, What do you think about the problem of uh, hydrogen in thermic combustion? Uh, so because that emits huge quantities of uh, uh, NOx or so nitrogen uh, oxide. Um, very very simple uh, yeah. question. I mean, very simple answer. I mean. I mean, the, the word huge quantities, uh, we disagree with. Uh, it, it, of course, it emits NOx, but if you have a lambda value of 2.2 to 2.8 in, in, in your uh, combustion engine, uh, you almost have uh, no NOx. Still, you have a little bit, but it, 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 it goes down quite drastically. Um, so um, it's not zero emission, that's, that's a fact. But uh, I do believe that hydrogen and combustion engines uh, are a good way in the, in, in the transition to really zero emission because they will create the, uh, the hydrogen value chain. I mean, you need to build hydrogen refueling stations, you need to have the tanks be prepared. So there's really, I mean, it, it makes sense to do it. And if you really tune your lambda values very well, of course, I know it has an impact on, on, on your driving force if you have too big, uh, I mean, uh, lambda. But normally I see that a lot of companies uh, are finding the right balance in that. Yeah. Okay. Another comment from uh, from uh, Philip. So uh, he was talking about the the fatal heat by synthetic fuels. For sure, I can already say that the project that we have in Wallonia uh, is trying to valorize this waste heat. Is it a topic for uh, FDHU, the waste heat valorization? Yes. It, it, and it will be even a bigger topic uh, now in the next JU. Uh, it's really something that. We have already done a few projects to use the waste heat, but um, because now we are really discussing with uh, the, the chemical side, uh, P4P, the other joint, in the, I mean, the other uh, partnership, and also with Clean Steel. And it's really something that we will do uh, joint projects in the future to use this waste heat uh, to use for something else. Yeah, absolutely. Or to use the, the waste heat to optimize your, for example, electrolysis process. I mean, high temperature electrolysis, for example. You still hear me? Yes. Okay. 
So it's not me. Yeah. It's Cedric. I think so, yeah. Okay, good. I was worried already. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry, but my colleagues uh, that are in another place than me uh, have lost internet. So uh, maybe we we'll can now. Uh, sorry for that, but uh, they will uh, be there uh, again as soon as possible. Uh, maybe we can now give the floor to the next speaker. We will have uh, uh, more time to question uh, also after. Uh, to, I think, uh, Karina Crystal uh, from Inno Energy. Yes, thank you, Paul. Thank, thank you. you, Bart, also for your presentation. Really interesting. And also for the introductory uh, presentation. I'm really happy to be here uh, to present uh, what we're doing at uh, EIT Inno Energy. Um, I'm the commercial director of the European Green Hydrogen Acceleration Center that has been launched by Inno Energy last year. And I'll give a presentation about the uh, ECAC, as we say uh, in brief, uh, uh, what we do uh, and how we can help uh, accelerate uh, green hydrogen projects. So I'm just going to bring up my screen. Uh, do you see? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, perfect. My thank you for having me and for, for being able to give this presentation. Um, I think uh, it really fully fits in what has been said before. Um, and uh, we just take, let's say, a little bit of a different approach uh, to the problem of hydrogen projects. So I think uh, what Bart uh, has talked about, let's say, uh, the innovation part, uh, bringing technology up to scale, etc., uh, this is really crucial. Um, in developing this hydrogen economy um, and we set on I think in a little bit of a later stage in the in the process which is starting now um, actually so maybe just a, a short overview of who is Inno Energy, uh, EIT Inno Energy so we're uh, a public private partnership as well we're um, mainly financed by the European Commission today and we are one of the uh, knowledge uh, uh, institutes of uh, EIT and we focus on energy. So our main mission is uh, to reduce risk and accelerate time to market of energy innovations in the European Union. Um, that is, let's say, the overarching uh, mission. Uh, but we also uh, work on, on the general objectives to ensure security and safety of supply of energy, to reduce costs uh, in the energy value chain, to reduce CO2 emissions, to create jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So everything related to the energy market um, to make this uh, fly and create really a prosperous energy market in Europe. And we have uh, four uh, main activities. Uh, so we work on human capital. Uh, number one, because if we want to have, let's say, um, innovations and foster innovations in the energy sector in Europe, we also need to work on, let's say, uh, the human capital side. So we need to have those entrepreneurs that will then build companies, that will build the startups that we need in order to, to foster uh, technological innovations. So we have master degree programs all across Europe um, that uh, in sustainable energy. Uh, we also uh, do incubation. Uh, so we invest in early stage startups. And this is one of our main activities also where we have invested now over the last 10 years um, in 350 uh, startups in the energy sector. And um, I think we're, let's say, in the, in the European policy space, we're quite known. But in general, uh, in Europe, we're not so much known. But we're still, let's say, one of the biggest uh, investors um, in renewable energy tech uh, in the world right after Shell Ventures. So we're quite significant and we have quite some impact. I think we probably spend our money more on impact than on, um, than on marketing. Uh, but just to say that we have a large uh, renewable energy tech uh, startup portfolio uh, and we often invest in early stage startups. Uh, so that means relatively small tickets, but we then help the startups get off the ground um, through uh, added value services that we provide. We help them through our ecosystem get access to um, funding, get access to partners, get access to customers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So everything that is needed uh, to, to scale them up and accelerate uh, their innovations. We also have a third activity, which is which we call innovation project. And that is where we actually look at more product development angle. Um, so that means you already have uh, 
a company that is established often this is trans european so several european countries getting together uh, that want to develop a product um, that have the consortium the business model etc already ready but that really want to need uh, develop this product and scale it up so those are really let's say in investments that we do that are uh, more significant um, like uh, let's say in a million space uh, but uh, and we have 150 projects like this also in our portfolio will really help uh, to develop products and then we have our fourth initiatives which is also what i'm going to talk to you about today which is our industrial value chain initiatives and bart has already mentioned um, earlier the european battery alliance so the eba um, which we have uh, set up that's our first initiative in value chains that we've set up uh, started to set up in four years ago uh, and we also now have recently last year launched the European Green Hydrogen Acceleration Center. This is what uh, our focus point is, but also the European Solar Initiative. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, just to give you some background on what that means for us uh, to work on value chains. So uh, we've been um, three years ago, four years ago, we've worked uh, together with the European Commission on uh, the EBA, which was to set up an industrial value chain of battery uh, production in Europe. Uh, and there the goal was uh, to really establish that market and bring back that value creation uh, to Europe uh, and uh, not outsource that part of the value chain, let's say to China, uh, because we have a lot of European uh, car manufacturers uh, and when they turn to electric vehicles, we also need to assure that we have this, let's say battery uh, value chain um, part of uh, in, in Europe and keep that value also in Europe. And so what we've done uh, together, uh, uh, mandated by the European Commission, we've worked on bringing together those actors across the value chain uh, and really very upstream to downstream, midstream, um, that have not been, uh, let's say, well organized in that sense. Uh, we brought them together, we try to understand what are the needs from a policy perspective um, to bring them let's say, together and to really create this market in Europe. And that was quite successful um, today, uh, already quite a significant market. And we've also, let's say, um, not only worked on the policy side together with the European Commission, but we also worked on, um, let's say, project development. And this is also where we will focus on in the European Great Hydrogen Acceleration Center, but I'll talk a little bit about that later on. But just to show you what we've done on project creation. So we, we worked uh, on this project called Northwald, which is a company um, in Sweden. Uh, and uh, we were early investors, so one of the first investors really early on. So we now some of you might know Northwald. So it's a really um, interesting uh, project that is really gotten quite some traction and it's therefore also our first unicorn that we've invested in and what Northwell wanted to do um, back then uh, they were an entrepreneur um, the former CTO of Tesla so quite somebody that is quite known that came to us and said um, together with other investors we want to uh, set up a giga scale factory um, of sustainable uh, batteries in Europe in Sweden and uh, can you help us to do that and uh, therefore we invested and we provide, let's say, uh, this is what you see here, all those added value services to the entrepreneur to help them uh, make the project as big as possible, uh, accelerate time to market and de-risk the investment. Um, and um, we do that, for example, and I'm just going to give two or three examples uh, to illustrate. But we, for example, help Northwold to get uh, customers. So we help them get in contact with Volkswagen, who became a strategic investor and um, where the strategic partnership has been quite successful. They're also setting up new uh, battery um, production sites now in Europe together, um, which also de-risks then the investment uh, for other investors to join because you have a strategic investor such as Volkswagen, which will also be an off-taker of the batteries that are being produced. Then um, we also help, for example, with getting access to finance. So. Um, we believe that uh, since we're, we're a trusted partner, let's say in the European energy ecosystem, we, uh, we screen projects really well. So we take care of where we invest uh, money in and, and therefore we also uh, lower the risks of other investors to join. And um, that helped, for example, Northwold to get uh, a fund, uh, a credit from loan from the European Investment Bank, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another thing that could be interesting is we also help, for example, uh, to look at the overall value chain again. So um, we're in the process of setting up now uh, raw material uh, mines, so notably uh, lithium uh, mines 
in uh, in Europe, uh, because if we want to really create products that uh, create as much value as possible in Europe, we also need to make sure that we source the raw materials. And I think Bart also mentioned that uh, on the supply chain uh, work that you're doing is to look at uh, how can we assure that the supply chain is also uh, scaling <laughs> with the technologies. Yeah, um, so this was just an illustration to show you uh, the different added value service we can bring uh, to projects. Uh, so we're not only working on policy in the, in the European Battery Alliance, but also really on creation of projects. And so when we look now at the European Deep Green Hydrogen Acceleration Center, which is our second uh, value chain initiative, here we're uh, looking at green hydrogen uh, as a mean to decarbonize industry. Uh, we see it as an important vector for sector thing, but I think everybody here in the call probably knows why uh, hydrogen is important um, in order to reach our uh, climate neutrality uh, goals by 2050. It's quite an important um, vector to develop. And um, in the European Green Hydrogen Acceleration Center, let's say the angle we're taking is uh, we're an industry-led initiative. So we work mainly with industry and uh, we want to help, uh, like we did uh, in Northwold, help uh, industrial initiatives around green hydrogen to get off the ground, uh, to make them big, to accelerate their time to market and to de-risk the investment. And we do that uh, for, let's say, um, those listed here uh, sectors. So we look at all the hard to abate uh, sectors where hydrogen can be applied to decarbonize. That would be, for example, steel, but also uh, shipping, uh, heavy good vehicles, fertilizers and aviation, and eventually also cement. And what we do is uh, we do that in um, taking really an end customer off-taker approach and to create a pull effect. That's, that's our goal. And I explain a little bit what that means for us. So when you look at, for example, um, the traditional value chain model that we see in an established market, and you know we we learn we know really well, let's say, the innovation side of of the market. So um, we we see that uh, traditionally we've built uh, projects like this, uh, especially when um, when the market is already mature. So you have each market uh, player that um, has been established that looks at, let's say, their own risk uh, on, on their own, let's say, plate. They look a bit upstream. Who are their upstream players? Who are the downstream players? But they don't have the overall vision of the overall value chain. And if you now, for example, want to produce a car that uh, uses green steel in order to decarbonize 30% of the, the car in production phase, um, what you would need to do in order to do that, you would have to bring all those actors together. They would have bilateral agreements one with each other, and therefore a price in the risk that they're having in such a project, um, each one of them. So you have a risk, therefore you have a, an increased margin, and that will be passed through um, throughout the chain to then in the end, uh, let's say, produce the end product that is, for example, um, a green steel manufactured car. And we believe that this is kind of a push effect, um, and, and uh, it also uh, creates, let's say, um, a bigger premium at the end of the of the chain because each actor uh, prices in their risk uh, and also therefore their margin. And what we see now happening is that we have uh, there are projects now that are being more and more constructed uh, in an SPV manner, uh, and that also you you are quite aware of, I guess. Um, but uh, what we want to do is we want to help uh, those uh, projects. Let's stay with uh, the steel example for a car. Uh, we want to help those projects to build uh, business cases where all actors join forces uh, in um, along the value chain to uh, produce, let's say, a green steel car. Uh, and, and that would mean then that risk is being shared because, for example, all entities co-invest in, in a new uh, venture. It's really venture building activity. Uh, they co-invest, they share risk, but they also share the benefits of it. And if we create projects like this, we reduce the premium at the end uh, of the chain, uh, therefore make business models fly, and we create a pull effect in the market. And I have a really good, let's say, concrete example on how, how that can work and how that actually does already work in, in, in the value chain, which is our H2 uh, Green Steel project, uh, which is our flagship project uh, in the north of Sweden. And... Um, there, uh, the, the project is set up as such that it has been co-created uh, with uh, the end of taker and value chain players, like I just explained before. And the goal of this project is to build a greenfield steel plant in the north of Sweden, greenfield. So a new steel plant being set up in Europe 
uh, 5 million ton uh, green steel uh, steel plants, so solely green steel, um, with a total of uh, 3 uh, to 2.5, so normally 2.5 uh, billion uh, investment uh, requirements. Um, the process is there is also some process innovations, let's say, uh, in this uh, project where um, we're using, um, so an, we're using, let's say, DRI uh, based uh, plus EIF electric arc furnace uh, made steel. Um, and uh, there's also, let's say, some uh, energy efficiency measures that are being taken in order to really make this pro pro project also from an innovative point of view more efficient, where we have, for example, continuous casting and rolling that we're applying, etc. And um, when we look at this project, uh, where there is some technological risk, for sure, because um, this has never been done before in Europe at that scale. Um, but uh, the project flies today without subsidies. And I think this is, uh, for me, quite uh, quite innovative uh, because what this allowed uh, to happen is that uh, we co-created the project together with uh, the end customer in the loop, you know, what I said before. So you have Scania, for example, um, who is a truck manufacturer, um, as well as uh, Mercedes-Benz now that have invested in this project as a strategic investor. Uh, and that will also be together with others, uh, off takers of the green steel that is being produced. And uh, you have also some, let's say, uh, high net worth individuals that have co-investors. You have um, like an investor from the IKEA group, the IMS Foundation, uh, but you also have along with the off takers that have co-invested also players along the value chain. So for example, um, scrap uh, handling um, companies, as well as let's say, um, the whole the DRI process manufacturing uh, companies, they are all part of this process. Um, and therefore, uh, what I said before, we join risk, but also gains of this project. And um, what I haven't said yet, but I think what uh, is quite important is that when you look at that project and you look at um, how it's being built, so this joint approach, uh, the premium that you have at the end of um, the steel that is being produced is relatively um, low. That means that, uh, for example, in this case, uh, we've analyzed that for other cases before steel, so I, it's not really the clear number for H2 uh, green steel, but it's in the range of like uh, 100 to 500 euro per ton of steel. So when you look at a car that today needs one ton of steel approximately to, um, to be produced, and you look at a car that costs you 30,000, 60,000, 80,000 euro, depends on the, the kind of car you're getting, um, you know, a 500 euro increase uh, in order to decarbonize 30% of the production of your car is really not a lot. So that can be passed on to the end customer. And we believe that um, this kind of initiative uh, can be multiplied number one in steel. So because in steel there we see a business case that is already flying today, but it can also be translated to other value chains. So uh, I told you before that we're working also on the fertilizer value chain, but also on shipping. And we see there that there is a similar approach to be taken um, when you look at fertilizer being produced with renewable hydrogen relatively upstream. How can you link that to the end customers or, for example, beer producers, uh, bread producers uh, that actually can pass on that premium because the impact at the, at the end product is not so high. So that's what we're, um, we're doing uh, together with other actors. Uh, we help, let's say, um, those industrial initiatives uh, on green hydrogen to develop this value chain approach to bring in end of takers and to try to build projects that are not as much reliant or maybe not even uh, reliant on subsidies. Uh, and um, I think uh, we can, as I said before, here's just another overview of the different, let's say, uh, services, added value services that we can bring to support uh, large scale uh, industrial uh, hydrogen projects we can help with um, the value chain approach and also access to market and customers. Uh, but we also help with access to finance, technology, supply chain, etc. And um, how actually the engagement with us works is uh, that uh, you can get in contact uh, with me directly. Uh, and we, we talk about uh, the initiative you're having, how we can support, if we can really bring added value as uh, EIT you know, Energy. And um, if we see that there is a, a real match, then um, you pass through our business investment platform. This is a matchmaking um, platform where we help those industrial projects um, get approved, let's say, by an external panel. 
and then uh, get engaged with us uh, through an investment uh, in your project, but also then through our added value services. And then we help uh, to make a matchmaking with investors uh, to make the business model fly and uh, create bankable uh, business cases. Yeah, that's, that's it from me, from my presentation. I'm just trying to come back here. Uh, thank you uh, for your um, attendance and your uh, availability to listen to this. And I'm really happy to take questions now, if there are any. Thank you very much, Karina, for your presentation. Uh, my colleagues still have a problem of electricity. Um, so uh, I will uh, maybe ask you one question of Nicola Brahi. Uh, good morning. Could you explain more what is your role in steel project? Invest in Series A only, also bigger amount in Series B. What has been your role compared to steel manufacturer and of takers in structuring the project? Yeah, so we thank you for that question, Nicola. So we're um, mainly, let's say, early investors, because that's where we we don't um, we have to take often really a small minority share uh, in projects like this. But our role is really to to de-risk projects from the start. So um, you know, once they're they're going to like let's say Series B, there's already been created some credibility. There's been uh, credibility uh, created on the entrepreneurs, on the team, etc. So. There we don't see our role. Uh, we see our role mainly in, on Series A, so really the first one. And um, yeah, what we do mainly is what I said is we we help with once we invest, we help with everything we can uh, to make the project big, uh, accelerate its time to market, and de-risk it. And that really depends from project to project. Um, but mainly, I think in the hydrogen space, what we see today, there is really a big need for for off-taker engagement. So the end of taker and building those really end value chain approaches. We also see a need uh, depending on, let's say, what kind of project holder you are. If you're more the entrepreneurial type or let's say a big corporate, we can help with access to finance and there might be different needs there. Then we can also help uh, in creating awareness, let's say in the political sphere, we can help with funding, um, getting access to funding and finding the right uh, funding programs. We help also with governance. Uh, so sometimes in, in boards, especially for entrepreneurs in boards, there we sit on the board to help um, steer the projects. We help sometimes even, you know, if really, really need is there, we help with human capital. So we bring people from our teams. You know? um, we help with partnership building. So that is often also something that is needed to leverage our ecosystem that is quite big uh, to identify the right partners for projects um, and really Create this. The overall goal is really always to um, create a business model that fly, uh, that flies, and a business case that flies, and uh, yeah, accelerate those developments and bring them to market quickly. Thank you, Karina. I take I take the lead right now. <laughs> I, Hi. I back, and, but we have some works in the building, so that's why the team works. Um, with two different locations, very important for webinars. Um, uh, we have received a, a question, but it was, I think, more related to the to the first um, presentation because it was related to uh, to heavy mobility. Just to say that there are some, uh, for sure, other players at Vanol that is providing its, these technologies. And uh, just to mention that we will, for the next presentation, uh, the next uh, meeting in September for the cluster, uh, we will have a presentation for the project Ashu Corridor uh, that will present all the heavy, uh, uh, let's say, vehicles that are provided uh, within Europe right now. So there will be uh, some uh, some. Uh, some question, and I see that there is a uh, an answer in the chat session. So, Karina, very thank you for the clear presentation that I've heard. So, <laughs> there, so very thank you for for this, and for sure we will come back to you because uh, there is some uh, for uh, industries projects from steels, but other sectors with end. Uh, users that you have mentioned, uh, the, the importance to have end users and off takers in the loop. And we have some of them in the cluster that want to provide some uh, uh, great reflect, reflection. So for sure, we will come back to uh, to Inno Energy with uh, with some uh, ideas. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, last presentation of today uh, will be um, 
the presentation of uh, an interesting project, uh, Loop FC. So the objective of this project is to the improvement of PE and uh, fuel cell technology and the efficiency in it. And we have the chance to have uh, Camila Vieira, uh, that is research engineer uh, at Cenero. And she was uh, uh, with a PhD from uh, Rio de Janeiro. So we will travel uh, from our uh, computer today. So uh, Camila, can you uh, share your screen? Uh, yes, sure. Um, okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so um, thank you all um, for being here today. And uh, as um, mentioned by Cedric, I will uh, give a short uh, um, explanation about one of the projects uh, funded by uh, Wallon Region, uh, which is Loop FC. This project is uh, related to the investigation of thermo efficiency of a fuel cell for building applications. And um, uh, this presentation will contain a, a, a briefly background of the project. Uh, I will also mention quickly some projects related to the same subject and uh, an overview of fuel cell. And then I will move to uh, Loop FC itself. And finally, just give some main remarks and perspectives. So as it's known, residential sectors correspond to a considerable uh, parcel of uh, the global greenhouse gas emissions in which carbon dioxide um, has uh, the greatest uh, amount uh, of percentage. And in 2019, uh, these emissions correspond coming from residential heating corresponded to third, almost 14%. And in Europe, this uh, value went up to 40% of the total energy consumption. Uh, it's also uh, important to highlight here that just in Belgium, uh, the total energy consumption should be reduced by 35% until 2030. And by 2050, we should uh, have uh, a clean energy with a zero uh, carbonization. Uh, in all in this context, uh, fuel cells uh, have a very important role uh, since it, it can use a clean hydrogen and it only produces as a, a product a vapor water. So it's a very important key. Uh, just uh, before um, showing everything, uh, just uh, since I'm talking about fuel cell, I will just explain quickly what's, uh, how a fuel cell functions. Here we can see uh, in this layout, um, uh, a schematic of a fuel cell. Uh, these uh, devices, um, it, it's, a, it's called an electrochemical device that converts essentially the chemical energy coming from uh, reduction and oxidation reactions between fuel, which is often hydrogen, and an oxidizing agent, which is often oxygen, uh, into electricity. Um, this fuel cell, it's um, very complex. It contains uh, several components, as you can see here. The key uh, point is the bipolar plate, which is the structure that uh, we have the flow of the fuel and the oxidizing agent. Um, and also we have a, a, a membrane electro electrode assembly in which we that is therefore the um, electrochemical reactions happening. This is a uh, this fuel cell once put in in a series, it makes a fuel cell stack, and in the process of producing electricity, we have also a release of heat, a considerable amount of heat is released because this is a very exothermal reaction, uh, the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. And so uh, before talking about Loop FC, some other projects have also uh, um, 
being uh, done in the subject of use of fuel cell. Uh, Inoxipane, for instance, is a, a project that has already been finished. Uh, it uh, studied a bipolar plate, uh, as shown here. Um, and uh, the, the goal here it was just as was to use a uh, fuel cell for a clean energy for transportation and the uh, in this project the optimization of this bipolar plate should uh, should uh, be done and uh, in order to improve the performance of the fuel cell now that that is also one project that's uh, ongoing it's uh, h2 cup storage uh, in this uh, this project is uh, involving several not only belgium but other two countries like uh, iceland and norway and uh, it's related uh, to energy consumption and to um, mostly to provide uh, tools for energy and with energy renewable uh, community, integrating a hybrid solution of both electric and hydrogen storage in a collective uh, self-consumption context as shown uh, here. So Loop FC is one of these projects that also related to fuel cell uh, usage, uh, hydrogen technology. And this uh, project uh, approaches the use of a proton exchange membrane fuel cell for electricity and heat transfer in a um, micro generation system for residential buildings, as shown here in this illustration. This uh, project should promote, therefore, uh, for all buildings equipped with this system, a better energy performance thanks to the heat recovery uh, from the fuel cell uh, and the use of this heat in a heating circuit in a residential building, making this building also more um, autonomous. Three main points are connected in this project. is uh, energy efficiency, improvement of the energy efficiency in the, in the building, the lifetime of the fuel cell, and also its cost. Um, so here uh, I show what is the global objective of the, fuel, the, 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 the project, is to develop a, a heat recovery system to be implemented in a fuel cell. This is the fuel cell uh, of the project which is a PMFC, uh, aiming at the reduction of the heat loss and its use in a grid power, reduction from 50% of the heat loss uh, to 8%, and using this heat in a residential building. The partners of these projects are Calios, which is involved in the development of the heat uh, recovery loop, uh, ULB, which is responsible for the setup of the experimental facility and the, and the experimental tests. Senaero, which is responsible for the numerical simulations of the fuel cell with the heat recovery loop and in the optimization of the system. Hydrogenics is just, it was uh, the industrial support uh, which provided the PMFC. So uh, quickly, I will just show what each partner has already done in the project and the roles. So Calios, that is responsible for the design of the loop heat pipe. Um, it's, um, it should um, not only develop, but test this uh, system as shown here. The loop, uh, loop heat uh, pipe should be posed as shown here in the fuel cell. And this loop uh, pipe uh, aims uh, to minimize the heat losses of the fuel cell. And it's composed by an evaporator and a condenser. The goal, uh, the two goals of Calios in the project is the evaluation of the cooling system uh, and uh, to reach a TRL for maturity level, which corresponds to validation in a laboratory environment. Um, what has already been done by Calios is the design of the, 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 the whole system of the, the heat, heat recovery system, as shown here. Uh, the fuel cell should be posed here. 
And so this system has already been developed and tested uh, by Cardios, but uh, since there was no fuel cell, they just used a, a heat source here to simulate the presence of fuel cell. Primary uh, tests have already shown a positive result, which means that the heat losses uh, improved uh, uh, the thermal efficiency by 15 to 20%. And now this uh, setup has already been sent to ULB, which is the um, uh, responsible for the experimental study. And uh, the acquisition of the commercial uh, fuel cell by the German manufacturer, Hydrogenics. And um, uh, ULB has already received the, by the, the, the system here. And with this, uh, experimental uh, tests it should uh, obtain the temperature measurement of the fuel cell, the heat flux uh, of the that is uh, released here in the system, and uh, yes, and and post process these in in simulate these in a residential building scenario. The campaign should start by summer autumn this year. What has already been done by ULB is the design of the primary circuit, which is uh, essentially is the water cooling system of the fuel cell. And uh, it's constituted by the fuel cell itself, flow meter, heat exchanger, and a pressure relief device. Um, so it has already been concluded and ready to use. And here the heat exchanger is uh, uh, linked to the secondary system which is uh, uh, aims the heat recovery of the fuel uh, cell for its efficiency, but also aims the future, uh, in the future, it should also simulate the water consumption cycles in households, allowing uh, a better heat power management in the buildings. It's not only constituted by the heat exchanger, but the CPL, which was previously shown, and the uh, radiator. It has not yet been concluded because ongoing work on hydrogen lines is still, uh, it is, you know, it, we still have some work on this, on this uh, phase of hydrogen, uh, but it should be uh, finished uh, by the end of summer. Last uh, uh, part of the experimental study is the acquisition and power management. And here, the, the system should be able to capture and process the temperature measurements and also simulate the electric consumption in the residential buildings. Uh, as soon as the secondary uh, circuit is finished, then therefore all can be worked uh, in a couple way. Uh, the the um, Senaero, which is the, uh, the company where I work, uh, it's responsible for the numerical simulation of the fuel cell. But in here, uh, in order to simplify the system, only the thermal aspects of the fuel cell will be uh, studied and, um, um, and no electrochemical aspects is taken into account in the numerical analysis. As we can see here, here in this uh, picture, this is the bipolar plate of hydrogenics. And uh, inside between the two bipolar plates, we have uh, the water cooling system. Water is, is uh, injected inside in order also to cool the fuel cell, which uh, PMFC fuel cell is uh, very sensitive uh, to high temperatures. Should we, you should avoid temperatures above 80 degrees. Uh, so, in order to keep and to maintain the temperature um, in a way that the functioning of the fuel cell is not compromised, it's important to have this water cooling system. Uh, since it's difficult to understand what's going on inside, the numerical analysis is therefore very important because here we can check several parameters. And once this uh, analysis is done, we can also check the efficiency of the CPL placed on these uh, on the lateral sides of the fuel cell. So some results that can be obtained from the numerical analysis are, the for, uh, for instance, the temperature field on 
the fuel cell uh, by um, uh, changing uh, different parameters uh, such as the saturation temperature in the CPL. Uh, and here in this, in our case, it's just a boundary condition. We cannot see the CPL itself, but uh, we can study the effect of the temperature in here, how it would affect the temperature of the cell. Uh, it also, we can also study the flow, uh, water flow inside the bipolar plates uh, direction, how it would affect the temperature in the cell, as well as the flow uh, rate of the cooling, uh, how much, uh, if increasing the, the, the flow rate, how it uh, affects the, the temperature in the, in the fuel cell. Once this is, uh, we have the experimental data, we can validate the system and then work on the optimization of the whole system in order to improve the heat recovery uh, in efficiency. So the main remarks is uh, on, about this project is, um, um, as, as I showed before, uh, some other projects have already worked uh, on the same, uh, on similar fields such as noxipam, uh, and we also had hydrogen coupe storage, which were briefly introduced here. And Loop FC is an ongoing project. Uh, and despite some delays uh, due to the pandemic situation, uh, the experimental tests and the final uh, study uh, on, on the, on a, in a grid power system is expected to happen by the end of the year. In terms of perspectives, this project have many importance in the, in the, in the uh, thermal management of buildings, not only uh, in the um, on the thermal management of the building, but the improvement of cogeneration system efficiency, and for the fuel cell itself, the heat recovery system it's also very important in terms of the lifetime of uh, uh, the uh, uh, the fuel cell, and it could also improve uh, the cost of the fuel cell. Because yes. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for, for being here and hearing me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Camila, uh, for uh, your presentation. I think it was clear. I see um, that uh, Bart is, uh, is mentioned that uh, you can look to the European project that have been mm -hmm. funded uh, because uh, for sure there is a, a lot of links uh, between your reflection and know-how and the uh, European calls to, to, to come. Uh, it was a good, um, uh, let's say, example of what we can do between an R&D center, university and startups uh, and small uh, companies uh, within this uh, H2 area. So thank you for, for your clear presentation. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to to conclude this uh, this session, I would really like to to thank the the our uh, four speakers of today. It was very clear, and I think we have some uh, steps to do with uh, some innovative project that we have um, uh, right now in the cluster and, and uh, for your your companies. Uh, the next step for our H2 Hub Wallonia will be the 17th of September. Uh, so for the um, H2 Mobility. Uh, session with a very dedicated morning about the trucks, um, but as well a presentation of airport, uh, so a hydrogen for airport um, uh, session during this day. Uh, in October, we plan to make a B2B session, really, because there is a need, a big need bit, uh, of the, the sector of hydrogen in Wallonia to meet each other, really, uh, to have um, a slot session between each and together. So we will make it happen in October or uh, early November. We have noted that uh, in the end of November, early December, there is the big meeting of Europe and uh, for sure we will invite you. And early next uh, year, we will uh, have uh, a mission to France uh, with Ronalp. Uh, we are preparing uh, an H2 uh, hydrogen mission uh, over there because there are a lot of uh, things that are going on um, over there. And uh, we want to propose to some members to go to go there and meet the 
the big players over there. So for sure, we have a lot of uh, things to do and uh, we stay at your disposal uh, for, um, for questions. Uh, we can make links with speakers of today, uh, links of, uh, of other players. For sure, webinars are not the best place to make a networking, but for sure in the second uh, part of the year, we will meet each other uh, with uh, this technology in mind. So very thank you to um, all speakers and you for your attention and uh, see you soon. See you soon, thank you.